In a secret wreath of ivy, the most fragile of birds peeps into its mossy cup. Bright-eyed and needle-billed, the grey and green goldcrest could appear dowdy, dull. But it wears a crown of fireworks, always ready to spark up and set the shadows of the woodland ablaze. Wow! Look at that! Welcome to Springwatch. Welcome to Springwatch 2023, coming to you from the very beautiful RSPB Arne Reserve here in Dorset. It's a lovely evening here, our mission as ever is to bring you the very best of British wildlife, not just from Dorset, but from all around the UK. We're here for the next three weeks and we're going to be covering this area with a separate mission and that is that we're concentrating on what happens when communities and people and organisations come together to cooperate to transform the landscape and that's happening here because this is part of a super national nature reserve made up of a mosaic of fabulous habitats everything from ancient woodland, salt marsh and critically of course that sandy lowland heath which typifies this part of the world. World. And we've made a good start, only yesterday we saw something for the second time in 200 years. Yes, ospreys were hatching in their nest on the edge of Pool Harbour. There was some bad news, I'm afraid a jay came to our missile thrushes and robbed all of its young, and despite the violent attentions of this buzzard bully, his smaller brother survived. There's been life, there's been loss, there's been drama, there's been excitement, so much action, and it's only day three. But listen, step aside, step aside. So kin the view. I mean, I think we've surpassed ourselves tonight on this beautiful spring evening. That is absolutely glorious. Strachan's postcards available <laughs> in a rack near you. <laughs> They're going to be top sellers, let me tell you. We've got our cameras all over this reserve and they're recording not only the sights of the nest, but also the sounds. So we thought we'd start off tonight's show with a, with a little challenge for you at home. We're going to play some sounds and we want you to see if you know what they are. So have a listen to this. Interesting sound. We're not going to give you a prize for guessing it, but we'll, we'll let you know what it is a bit later on in the show. And if you get it right, you can give yourself a pat on the back. Anyway, let's have a look at all our live cameras. We've got a fantastic variety. There we I love it. Right in the middle, top row, we've got the oyster catcher. Always there, always reliable. But I'm not going to go to the oyster catcher. I'm going to go to the Dartford warbler specialist species in this area and doing very well. There are chicks in that nest, I promise you, but unfortunately you can't see them and you can't see the gorgeous adult either. What a shame. But there uh, we go. I'll tell you what, let's go to a gorgeous adult. Let's go to the nightjar. There's our female incubating her clutch of two eggs. What a bird. Oh my goodness me. I'd go out with one. You know why? because I'd never find it. <laughs> Look at that! Sensational! Absolutely sensational! It really is, isn't it? What about this, though, for sensational? Let's go to our Osprey Nest Live. Just a reminder, this isn't in the Arne Reserve, it's in Pool Harbour. That camera's being controlled by birds of Pool Harbour, and this is a very special nest. Look at them, they're taking a little bit of food off there and feeding it to their chicks. Because as Chris said at the beginning, this is only the second time that osprey have bred in Dorset in the last 200 years. So very, very special indeed. There were three eggs. By the time we left them yesterday, two little chicks had hatched, and just look at that delicately feeding them. Wow, don't they look tiny? Look at that, Chris. I mean, they look so small against those adult birds. Very, very precious chicks. The egg is next to them. No movement at all in the egg. There's no crack. And I know I'm usually the positive one, but you know, the parent birds have not been brooding that egg very much. So I'm afraid I'm going to be a bit Oh, hold on a minute. I'm feeling a little faint. <laughs> have you been gripped by a sense of reality? 
I don't think that egg is going to hatch. That's my prediction. But they do lay asynchronistically, so they may hatch asynchronistically, which means, you know, at different times. So there is a chance... But I'm not hopeful, and you? No, I'm not going to ask your challenge there. I think as well there's little chance of that hatching now. But we've got two young in the nest, and that's what it's really all about. Now, if you were watching last night, we showed you a kestrel's nest, which is quite close to our production village. We can go live to that area now. And we've got a female. Here's the female kestrel. It's taking a bit of a break. It's had a busy day providing for all of the chicks which are in the box. I say all of the chicks, there are five of them in there, sleeping off their many meals that they've had today in a nice warm pile. But yesterday, when we showed you this nest for the first time, there were six chicks, and one of them, sadly, was in the process of expiring. It was considerably smaller than all of the others. It hadn't been getting as much food, and it was dying. But nevertheless, it was a valuable resource. The female had laid an egg, had been feeding that young, had invested an enormous amount into it. So nature takes control here, and redistributing that resource was important. Thus, she tears it up and feeds it to its siblings. So this is going to look like horrible cannibalism, but in the grand scheme of things, in the natural world, this is really important. One of these morsels could just be enough to sustain one of those young kestrels. Life in the wild is always hanging on the balance, so any little advantage that it can take to survive will be snatched at. And that's the way we have to look at that rather sad story of the young kestrel. I know it makes sense, but it is harsh. I mean, eating your sibling is definitely a brutal thing to do, isn't it? And not, not easy to watch, but as you say, you've got to make the most of it. My every sister resource. is alive and well. <laughs> But they're not the only ones that have a bit of sibling rivalry. It's happened to our buzzards as well. Certainly when we put the camera on them early on, look at them. You've got one much bigger than the other. We presume those eggs didn't hatch at the same time and that's why there's a difference in size. But look, that bigger one is pushing the smaller one almost off the nest. And do you know what I find surprising about that? If you looked, you could see that the crop of that little one was full. So there's obviously enough food for both of them. It's not about food at all. I mean, you know, why squabble if you've both got food? That's the question and I And it's ask. unusual in these buzzards, we have to say. Let's have a look at them live, though, because they're doing pretty well. And as you can see there, the squabbling has stopped. They've settled down. And this is certainly what we've noticed over the last couple of days. That squabbling definitely is not happening as much. Although, look at the look. Look at the look on that. I wouldn't bigger turn my face. back on that other bird. <laughs> no, if I was the little guy in that nest, <laughs> mm, I'd be pretty vigilant. Yeah, that, that it's definitely not enjoying its smaller sibling sharing its space, is it? And if body language told you anything, look at that. But, as I say, the parent bird is coming in. There's plenty of food. And again, this is interesting. Parent bird has brought food in, and those two chicks are not interested. They're full. They don't need any more. So that's fantastic. I mean, they should continue developing, and that hopefully, fingers crossed, with my positive hat on, is going to be a successful nest. Indeed. Again, yesterday, we briefly introduced you to a wren's nest that we'd found down in the woodland. We can go live to that nest now. Um, it looks pretty intact. But in fact, I can tell you, it's endured some drama today. Well, the day started well. The wrens were coming in and breeding, uh, bringing food to the brood. Now, we didn't know how many chicks were in there at this stage. They're still relatively small, but you can hear them there clamoring for the food as the adults were bringing that food in. But, as I say, drama unfolded a little bit later in the day. Perhaps it was that noise, perhaps it was the noise of those chicks screaming for that food when the adults arrived, but this is what happened. A jay had found it and came in and removed one of the youngsters. Now, these corvids have got remarkable memories, so despite the fact that the adults continue to feed the wrens, the jay, we imagine, would be back, and we weren't wrong because just a short while afterwards, it came back in and removed another youngster. Would it give up? Obviously not. There's a whole meal here for its own young, hidden away in another part of this woodland. So three gone, the adults continue to come back and feed them, and we were thinking, well, it might just make it overnight. 
And I wasn't holding any great hope that that would be long enough for the jay to forget about it. I mean, remember, these are birds which will bury 5,000 acorns in the autumn and remember where a large number of those are. So I don't think it's going to forget a wren's nest, and it didn't, because then later this evening, the jay came back again. Stunning bird, you have to say, even if it's in the bad business when it comes to the wrens. But look at those wing feathers. Very striking. And here, it can't quite reach that wren, so it pecks away at the top of the nest. It's no protection for a bird the size of a jay, of course. And off it goes with that chick. So if you haven't been counting, this is the sixth time that it comes back and it removes the final chick. So there were six chicks in there and they've now all been removed in the course of one day by the jay. As we so frequently see, the adults come back to the nest, they're bemused by the fact that it's been robbed by the jay and they come back with food, attempting to feed their, sadly, non-existent young. But it's early in the season and wrens will no doubt have uh, another attempt. So fingers crossed for those wrens next time round that they choose a site where the jay doesn't find it. I think that's the heartbreaking bit, isn't it? When the adults come back and have a look with food in their mouth and there's nothing there and they're just deflated. I'll tell you what, Chris, my, my emotions are all over the place. I'm emotionally drained and, and we're only, what, 10 minutes in? We're 10 minutes into <laughs> programme three and we've had lots of drama already and you can keep your eyes on those cameras from 10 in the morning until 10 at night if you want to stay tuned to all of the action. And given the way things are playing out, you might even see it before we do. Anything could happen. I think we need to take a little bit of a deep breath and go to Gillian in North Wales and hopefully it's a bit calmer there, Gillian. <laughs> it is calmer, but we still have quite a lot of drama here as well. We are back for a second night at Gwaith Powder. It is a North Wales Wildlife Trust nature reserve. And looking around me, it's really hard to imagine, but this landscape was once scarred and barren. This used to be the site of an explosives factory, but now nature is reclaiming it back. And there's one little bird species that makes its way all the way from a little corner in West Africa to come and breed here. And this is it. It's the pied fly catcher, an absolutely stunning bird. This is the male looking really smart there with those white wing panels. Really beautiful birds. They also have the little, what I call the headlight, that white patch just above the beak there. And this is the female, same markings minus the headlight, as I call it, a little dustier as well. So not quite as crisp, but you can see there she had something in her beak there. That's the name, the fly catcher. Now these birds migrate all the way from Africa, from West Africa, they make an enormous journey which includes spanning and flying right over the Sahara Desert, which they do in one non-stop flight in around 38 hours, it's thought. So that I think is absolutely remarkable for a bird that's about 12 centimeters, 12 grams. It weighs about the size of a large strawberry, so pretty amazing. Now, our wildlife camera operator, Steve Phillips, has been spending the last few days here, and he's been treated to some real interesting behavior. So let's start first with the female. Let's take a look at that dusty brown female again. Now, you can see her here. This is why they call fly catchers. She's not just got a fly, she's got a damselfly. This female proved to be a real damsel huntress. Now, we didn't see her just catch one of these. We saw her catching these time and time again. Now, bear in mind, she's plucking these damselflies from midair, and this is her returning to the perch after each flight. And then, after taking stock, returning to her nest box, you can just about make out the number there, number 14. And she deposits it in, in less than a minute, she's out to do it all again. Now, I said, this is quite a feat, catching insects in flight, but what is even more impressive is catching damselflies in flight. Now, damselflies, along with dragonflies, are some of the most amazing aerial predators in the whole animal kingdom. Around here, the damselflies are doing really well. This is a large red damselfly. There's lots of ponds and water bodies, but it's an opportunity to see those wings. They have two pairs of uniform wings that they can beat more or less independently, which allows them to fly forward. It allows them to fly backwards. It means they can turn in mid-flight. They're really amazing. So for that female to be able to pluck those out of the air is really, really impressive. But it was not the only thing she proved to be good at. 
that. Now, there was a lot more going on at number 14 than any of us were bargaining for. So this is her mate, this is the male. Now, if we take a really close look, you see that patch there above the beak. I like to think of it like the headlights. It's a really nice feature because it allows you to distinguish the individual. His is bright, it's big, it's bold. It even has a little flick there. Now, this is another male. And this was a male visiting the same nest box. Now, his little headlamp there above the beak is not as crisp. It's a bit smaller, it's a bit faded, it's a bit messy. And those little white patches are what the females are looking for in terms of attractiveness in a mate. Somehow, though, she seemed to have mated with both of these males. And we saw them coming out. She obviously asked them to take the rubbish out. This is mate number one taking a fecal sack out of that nest box. But both males seem to be going in and out of that same nest box, number 14. Now, it's possible that the clutch that she has in there, the chicks are just mated from one of the males. She might have two clutches there, chicks from both males. But unfortunately, this is a case of who's the daddy? Nobody knows. So both males continue to provision and help that female raise those chicks because they may have skin in the game. There may be genes there that they want to make sure make it to fledging. So it's an absolutely amazing story. Not all pied flycatchers do this. Most of them are monogamous, but it's really interesting to see this behavior here. And it may be playing out in other parts of their range in the country, in Wales and the west of England. Now, Megs, I don't know whether you find this interesting, but I do. And certainly, I think it's quite a good strategy, getting a little the best of both worlds, maybe. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we see that with various bird species, actually. I mean, why waste all your energy when you could maybe get the help of two males to give you a helping hand? I mean, makes sense to me. Um, now, of course, over the course of the last two episodes, we've shared with you some really important heathland specialists. But what I'm about to introduce you to now is perhaps the most ferocious, maybe slightly terrifying, and the ultimate assassins of the sand. Come and have a look at these. Now, these were caught earlier today, and after the programme, they will be immediately released to where they came from. These are two species of tiger beetles. Now, let's look at the green tiger beetle first. Now, it is very obvious. It is iridescent in its colour. It's a, an amazing animal that doesn't have to worry about being camouflaged too much because it is one of the most ferocious predators out there. Now let's take a look at the other one. This is a heath tiger beetle. Looks a little bit different, still quite obvious. It's got that black and white marking. You can see it there cleaning itself. A really gorgeous animal, but actually in much more severe decline. The green tiger beetle is relatively common across this area, but the heath tiger beetle has sadly lost about half of its population in the last 25 years. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at it within its environment. Here it is looking rather adorable and unassuming, but actually it can move incredibly fast. Now here it is wandering, but when it's in pursuit of its prey, it can run essentially about half a meter a second. It is absolutely phenomenal. I'm yet to see one, just coming across one. Um, so I'm really on the lookout for this predator because they might be small, but they are incredibly powerful. Look at it there. It looks almost robotic, quite mechanic, wandering across the sand like that. They are really remarkable animals. And uh, the National Trust, part of this super national nature reserve, found there are lots living on a footpath. And they decided that because of this, they would do a conservation effort to basically expand that foot footpath, helping that habitat, helping this declining species. So here you can see the footpath as it is expanded, and there are lots of heath tiger beetles there, which is really brilliant to see. Now, of course, that helps us see these heath tiger beetles closer up. But if you were their prey, you know, a caterpillar or a spider or an ant, actually, you really don't want to be seen by them. And this is why. This is a green tiger beetle hunting. There you can see it, the stealth of it and an ant. At this point, unaware. But look how fast it runs, and it's got it. And within a few seconds, it's using those mandibles, those really strong jaws, to eat it up. Now, look here, you'll see the larvae of the tiger beetle. Again, another ferocious predator, but look carefully. Bow! Eating the ant, dragging it down its burrow, and consuming it. 
Now, let's have a look at the larvae. I have a fantastic prop here, another Lucy Lapwing prop. Now, this is my larvae and the head is quite hard and it sits on the, on the bank like this in the sand. But let's look, if we take it out, this is its soft underside. So whilst it's protected on its head, this belly here is really soft and it will go through about three larvae stages throughout the course of its lifetime and it will go through three molts. Over the space of about two years it will be a larvae and each time the burrow will have to continue to expand. Now if I go back here, I have my ant and essentially what happens is it fills the vibrations and the larvae will come out, grab it, take it in to eat it. But is this an ant or is it something different? Well this is where it gets interesting. Now this is no ant at all, this is a parasitic wasp, a methica parasitic wasp. And what happens is the larvae shoots out, thinking it's an ant, but this parasitic wasp stings the soft underside, drags the larvae down into its burrow and lays an egg on it. The larvae at this point is paralysed and when it's finished laying its egg it comes back up and tops it with sand. How remarkable is that? I mean, the hunter has ultimately become the hunted. You know, we can't think everything's an ant. This is a parasitic wasp, and when it comes out like this, oh, it's so cool. I mean, it's dangerous, it's fascinating, and they are remarkable animals, albeit pretty, pretty hardcore. Now, it's time to take a step away from the, well, the dangerous, shall we say, and head up to Northern Scotland, where Scottish naturalist Jess McCarthy has really got to know her very cute neighbours. My name is Jess McCaffrey. I started watching nature local to my home after joining a volunteer group with Scottish Badgers. I'm really, really lucky because although I live in a big built up town, I can come here to the woodlands in Calder Glen and today I'm going down into the valley where it all started for me. I came along here and this was my first sign of foraging that I found in this wooded area. So I carried on and noticed the foraging continuing a long path and up onto the ridge up there. When I found signs of badges in the wild, I doubted myself. So I put up a camera to check and see if there's any wildlife to be found inside. And lo and behold, when I checked the footage, I found badgers living in the set and badger cubs. I was so excited, I had to get another camera and find out what other wildlife is in my glen. I started placing my cameras in areas where I could see nice trails to see who was using it. And before I knew it, I had badges, but there's also been foxes, there's been deer, and in the burn, I had otters. There's just a wealth of wildlife living really close to each other. This year, what's caught my eye is a beautiful dog fox that's moved into an old badger set. The fox showed up around April and he's really recognisable with distinct white socks in his back legs. So I decided that I was gonna call them white socks and I was gonna try and see what he was getting up to. At first, I was a bit worried about the foxes and the badgers and how they were going to cohabit, especially considering the dog fox continuously seems to want to start fights with the badgers. He seemed to be instigating fights every night, chasing, growling, really not quite happy of the badgers' presence there. I wasn't quite sure why this was happening, but it became clear a couple of weeks later when a couple of little fox cub faces popped up from underground. 
It's just adorable to know that we have a Badger family that lives in a set and just round the corner in the same set, I've found a Fox family that live there. And during the time that the cubs were only a couple of weeks old, White Sox was providing all the food. He was coming back every single day with prey that he'd hunted and caught, and he was giving it straight to the cubs and clearly showing them affection. It was really lovely because that's behavior that I would normally expect to see from the vixen. Once I knew that the foxes had cubs, I thought I'd put another couple of cameras up just to monitor the area and see how the behavior between the foxes and badgers changed as the cubs got older. But unfortunately, things escalated before I even got a chance. When I went to check the fox footage, they were gone. And at that point, I started really worrying. Could they have died? Mortality rates in cubs are really high. You really do become emotionally attached to the animals that you're watching. So it can be really upsetting when you think that something bad could have happened to them. Since the White Sox family have moved out, the badgers seem so much more relaxed, they're happy, they're not nervous anymore. They're using this whole area to play. But we do not know where White Sox could have gone or where his cubs are. I decided to take it upon myself to look where White Sox has moved his family to. Just round the corner from the first badger set was a secondary badger set. And I didn't know if it was in use. So hopefully the cameras will tell us what's really going on. I love that. Cave badgers. Cave badgers. I like when they're all bounding out of the cave. I've never seen that before. But also, just see the foxes. Lucky girl, eh? I know, that male, White Sox, what a fantastic animal. I have to say, since Jess made that film, she has found White Sox and his family, but they haven't gone back to that original den and she can't find the other den at the moment. But in the process of looking, she came across this. Another family of foxes. This time it's a vixen with five young. Look at that. Fantastic. What a fantastic mammal. I've got to say, my favourite. And so special to see them feeding out in the open like that. Oh, look at them. I know, I know. Look how busy they are. You be really patient, don't you, if you're a vixen with that many young. Superb, absolutely superb. And Jess has been following the fortunes of this fox family now. And we're very pleased to say that we're going to be bringing you their story over the next couple of days and into next week. So we've brought you drama, but look at that, we bring you cute as well. We can do both on the watches, can't we? Let's have a look at our live cameras and see if there's any more drama going on there. I almost daren't look, actually. We're going to show you a camera that we haven't shown you yet. It's the Nest of a blackbird. Let's go to that live. I love this. Look, it's in a it's in a fallen down tree, so it's in a stump. And if you go right in, look how well hidden that nest is. So well hidden, I'm actually struggling to see it. There you go, you can see the chick. You can see, isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, you can only see it when the chick pops its little head up. We know that there are four chicks in that nest tiny little heads popping up wanting to be fed in flies the male and look at that beak absolutely full of things to feed it with and then the female comes in as well they're both bringing in plenty of worms for those four hungry mouths filling them up so that's where it is oh look at this bit though i love this bit <gasps> Look at the little chick popping out. Doesn't want to go to sleep. <laughs> Snuggling like me back down. Constantly sent upstairs to the bedroom <laughs> to go to sleep. Look, look, watch, watch. What's that? What is that that we've circled in the right hand corner? It's a J. It is a J, and that is the male that chases the J off. Let's just rewind that, watch it again. Look closely. 
and you can see that's the jay and I hate to tell you this but that nest of the blackbird is only about 80 meters away from the wren nest so that is probably the same jay that took all the wren chicks so we're gonna have to keep a close eye and keep our fingers crossed for those cute little black how are you feeling because you were quite negative about the osprey I'm feeling positive on. I'm feeling positive I positive think... for the blackbirds yeah because I think the jay's full <laughs> not, not hungry anymore. <laughs> Brave. <laughs> Brave know. and bold from you there. I know. Keep your eyes on the live cameras. Now, you know, yesterday I went looking for our six UK reptiles mm -hmm. that you find here. Had a little bit of trouble with the adder, although I did see signs of it with that skin. You're giving me a look. Well, that's because you, you, say, you produce no evidence of the skin that you found. I which did seems see really it. strange to me because I've never found an adder skin and not been compelled to put it in my pocket and show it to someone. I don't know if you've noticed, but you and I are quite different in many ways. <laughs> anyway, Gillian has seen adders and she's going to tell us more about them. Gillian. <laughs> Well, we're hoping to see adders as well up here. But yes, we're back at Gwaith Powder. And we've come up to one of the highest points in the nature reserve because it's a really good chance to take a look at some of the features that make this such a superb reserve. We've got the tidal estuary behind me, there's steep sided valleys and a real mosaic of habitat. Now, the adders do really well in this habitat here. That's a female there. And she may be gravid, possibly at this time of year. That's a male with a much more contrasting black on white pattern, that real telltale zigzag. Beautiful animals. Now these are one of the most, well, the most northerly occurring snakes in the world. They're found all the way into the Arctic Circle. They'll mate in April into May and they'll stay active right the way through until October when they return to their high binacular in, for the winter. So Gwaith, at Gwaith, the University of Bangor, and also the Wildlife Trust monitor the adder populations here. And the way they do that is they use these very bog standard roof felting tiles. Now, we know there's not one any, any under here, so we can have a little closer look. So the tiles effectively, especially on cold days, will soak up the heat from the sun and they'll act like little heat blankets. And the adders and any other reptiles like the slow worms will actually slide underneath that and soak up that heat. So it's a really great resource. This is really one of the most effective ways to monitor the populations because if you take a look at the habitat around here, you'll see why it is so very difficult to actually count absolute numbers. It's a real tangle of gorse and bracken. A lot of that habitat is really very difficult to get into. It's certainly great for the adders, great for their prey items, but mo really the most dedicated scientists and volunteers will get right into that. So. When we think about adders, I'm sure there's one fact that you all know about adders, which is they're Britain's only venomous snake. And that makes us think of these ambush predators lying to pounce on things. But actually, they have other behavior that is in their repertoire that's quite interesting. Now, one of our story developers, Jack Richards, managed to film some really beautiful behavior in South Wales near Bridge End. And this is what it is. Look at this. Now, this is two males. And it looks like they're dancing, but this is more the snake version of a rut. Now, they are armed with fangs and venom. They could be fighting to the death, but that'd be totally pointless, to be honest. Instead, they choose to have a little duel where they try to pin the opponent's head down. So that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to get the upper hand or the upper head, if you like. And it doesn't need to be for very long. Just a brief moment of a hold down is all it takes for the adders to establish dominance. If you watch carefully, it doesn't last long. And there it is, dominance established and they disengage. Now, like I said, it is difficult to count absolute numbers, but what you can do is monitor trends. And of the 129 sites around the whole country of adder populations that have been monitored, 90% of them are in decline. And it's not just about absolute numbers, it's about fragmented habitat. 
and something called inbreeding depression. Now, this is the genetic health of population. Now, here's one of those snake sheds that Michaela said she saw. This is one that we've been handed a specimen um, from the university. Now, this is what scientists use to monitor the genetic health of populations. All they need is a tiny fragment of this, something like half a square centimeter is enough to provide genetic material to tell them the health of the, of the individual, but also the health of the whole population. And what they're finding is here at Gwaith, but also other populations, is that the snakes are very inbred, and this means that their breeding success is quite low. It means their survival rates are low as well. So what's interesting, or what maybe what is quite stark, is if we do absolutely nothing, these populations, which are isolated, they're like island populations, um, will go extinct within the 10 years or so, so until 2032, it's thought. So that's the bad news. There is good news. Like we said earlier, like Chris said, the joined up thinking, linking up these habitats and allowing these snakes to breed and disperse is the key. And you can definitely support your national and local conservation organizations that are helping to link up these beautiful habitats for the adders and also for other wildlife. Now, the other thing I find interesting is adders, of course, and snakes in general, people are very scared of them. But what I find is that you love to send us your photos when you do come across adders. So these are some of the photos you sent in. It's a great opportunity to get a nice close look at some of these. Now, these are the cold adaptations. You can see the scales there and there's black skin under those scales, a dark body that helps them to trap that heat, soak up that heat from the sun during the cold weather, cold springs and the cold air. So absolutely fantastic animals, but facing some big challenges. Now, of course, we know that there are sort of natural challenges, man-made challenges, but certainly nature challenges all sorts of wildlife, as we find out with this Kingfisher family. Echoing downstream are the calls of a seldom seen yet unmistakable bird. A female kingfisher with an emblematic orange lower bill. Close by, a black-billed male. A potential partner. But first, he must prove himself worthy. So he's angling for her alliance. By hunting for something very particular. And it seems this fish will do the trick. He presents her with his catch. It's a seemingly simple gift, but it tells her everything she needs to know. He's capable of providing for a family. At any other time of the year, kingfishers live alone, safeguarding precious food supplies. Only now, during the breeding season, do they set aside their solitary ways, pair up and pool their resources. As time goes on, the gentle rhythm of spring picks up pace. The pair have settled in to a bankside burrow where they're raising their first brood. For them, and many of the river's other residents, leisurely spring days have turned into frantically busy weeks. To feed themselves and their young, the kingfishers are catching up to a hundred fish every day. But spring can be a turbulent season. The skies darken with a downpour that lasts for days.
the river swells with rain and vegetation stoops under the weight of water. They can hear the desperate calls of their chicks, but the parents can't get into the nest. For two days, they struggle, whilst their brood starves inside. Eventually, driven by hunger, the chicks abandon the nest. The parents desperately continue to bring them food, but they're weak and there's nothing they can do to save them. Around half of kingfisher nests perish. Owing to this adversity, these birds resolutely make two or even three nesting attempts every season. Elsewhere, more fortunate birds are successfully fledging. At nearly four weeks old, these strong, healthy chicks are tempted from their nest by the promise of an alfresco meal. This quality catering won't last for long. Within just four days of fledging, kingfisher parents cease to provide food. The chicks are aggressively banished to find their own way in the world, and before long, the adults part ways too. By the end of the breeding season, all bonds are broken, disappearing in a flash of blue, as the birds return to their enigmatic and isolated existence. I have to say, those sorts of incidents with the kingfisher's nest that we saw there, either being submerged by flood water or overgrown by vegetation, are not uncommon. But the good news is that kingfishers can breed up to three times in a season and they can have quite a few young, sometimes between five and eight. Emotional roller coaster again, though, wasn't it? Now, at the beginning of the show, we set you a challenge. We played the sound from one of our nests and asked you to guess what it was. Have another listen. Now, we had a few wrong guesses. Natterjack toad, mm. corn crake, mm. and we had a lot of right guesses. Oh, did we? Yes, we did. Wow. It was the night jar. Have a look. sounds and we're going to play those again so I can explain exactly what is going on because it's actually the female that's on the nest that's calling in the male you can hear that sound look that you can see her throat moving and then they do that dance that little waggle dance and then the male does the whoop. so the female does the brrrr, and then it's the whoop. and then they do that that sort of twerking, don't they, when they meet each other at the nest? I'm not familiar with that, but whatever. I, I am familiar with that sort of peeping sound that the male makes, but I've never heard that bubbling sound. You'd have to be very close to the nest. And a cursory examination of the literature that we made today shows that it has been recorded before, but not often. So this is a unique opportunity to see something very special about a very special bird. Actually, what's also unique is we've got an infrared camera on that nest. We had a nightjar nest last year, but we only managed to see it in the day but now we're seeing behavior at night as well and this is really special now this is the male on the nest it's the female that's on the nest most of the time but at this particular point it's the male it's dark remember the male flies off and then the female takes over female settles down and keeps those eggs warm as I say remember it's night time and it's dark, and this is an infrared camera. And just to prove that, we've got the moon there. <laughs> but this seems to go on throughout the evening. And so now the female's on the nest, and then she flies off. Male calls her, whoop, whoop, 
with that noise. Then they fly off together. They leave the nest. So the eggs are bare on the nest. That jay, fortunately, is asleep at this point. Mm. And then what's quite interesting is they seem to fly off together. So the male almost seems to guard the female. It's great that the female gets a break from sitting on that nest. And this happens a few times throughout the night before the, she then goes back onto those eggs and settles down. But as I say, this is great because this is footage that we've not seen before. They're more active at night, obviously. They're nocturnal birds. And so hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll see a lot more behaviour and be able to unravel what's going on. Should we go live? Let's have a quick yeah, look, let's have a quick look at them look live. At those so that's the female, isn't it? Clearly there. She hasn't been relieved by the male yet this evening. Well, as I say, it's the female that sits on that nest most of the time. Yeah. And then the male takes over a couple of times. Look at her! Come on! Look at her! Oh, goodness me, up. get yourself Looking a postcard gorgeous. of that! <laughs> Not the view! Forget hey, the what view. about some cracking science? In 2021, four scientists, Horsberg, Mitchell, Dawson and Maher, from the universities of York and Sheffield, went out and collected piles and piles of nightjar poo <laughs> from their nest sites and their roost sites. And they analysed it using the capacity to identify prey in it with its DNA. And they came up with some fascinating results. I've got a graph here. The first thing is that they found that 99% of all of the foo had, uh, poo had lepidoptera in it. That's butterflies and moths, clearly moths, because it's nightjars they're foraging at night. 27% of it had flies in, just 9% beetles. So most of their food is moths. But then they could identify those moths to species level. Then they ran a moth trap. And the results of that are shown here in terms of moth size. So the moth trap is a means of sampling all of the moths that are in the environment where the night jars are living. And then they looked at the percentage of those sized moths in the night jars diet. So look, here's the moth trap data here. So that's the percentage of moths that are smaller than a wingspan of 2.5 centimetres. Here are the middle-sized moths, and here are the larger moths. So this is the percentage in the moth trap. But look at what the nightjar's actually eating. It's eating far fewer of the smaller moths and a far greater number, a disproportionate number, of the larger moths. Marge, uh, moths with a wingspan of greater than six centimetres. Really big moths. And this is an example of what we call size selective foraging. What's more, the DNA was so accurate, they didn't identify just the size of the moth, obviously, but the species of the moth. And they found that this species, the greater younger, uh, yellow underwing, appeared in 52% of all of the faecal samples that they collected. Not surprising, perhaps, because this moth has increased by 72% in recent years. They also found, in second place, this species, the true lover's knot. This appeared in 49% of all the species, but this is more unusual, because this species, in the same period of time, has declined by 88%, except that it's doing quite well on heathlands, where the night jars are foraging. So clearly here, in this super national nature reserve, with all of the heathland, the night jars are doing very well. But we have to worry about birds that are feeding on moths outside of that. Because Butterfly Conservation's State of the Nation's moths tell us that in the last 50 years, the population of larger moths in south of England has gone down by 39%. So whilst night jars are actually increasing very slowly at the moment, many other species that are feeding on large moths or their caterpillars, things like cuckoos, are in decline. Isn't that amazing what you can find out by delving into night jar poo? I love that. That's <laughs> proper science. Top work, guys. Top work. Now, night jars on the mend, but sometimes nature needs a helping hand. Um, in terms of the sea eagles that have been brought back here in a reintroduction project that was started on the Isle of Wight a couple of years ago. Um, initially, of course, they were in captivity, then they were released. I had an opportunity to see one flying in the wild for the first time, and I got rather excited. Oh, there's one just there, Chris. There you are. Oh, my goodness me, look at that, yeah. Superb. Yes, white-tailed eagles. 
Oh, look at that. The sun shining. Oh, look at the beak. Look at the beak. Look at, the, look look at, at the, the beak, the sun bird. shining on it. I've got to tell you, I was so <laughs> excited. I never dared imagine that I'd see that relatively close to my home. And I've got to say, without bragging, because it's not an unfamiliar thing now if you're living in the south of England, certainly in Portsmouth, Southampton, Bournemouth or Poole, to have these on your garden list. Mm. On my garden list, Smug. yes, I will. Yeah, <laughs> well, Smug. but not not alone, because lots of people are now have these birds, white-tailed eagles, on their South of England garden list. Now I've seen them in the garden, but I'm afraid to say, Megan hasn't added them to her <laughs> list yet. Have you, Beast? You're just putting salt in the wound there, Chris. I mean, that's not. I mean, I think you're making it up. I don't think you've seen one at all. I wouldn't really. make that up. I'd never make that up. How dare you? <laughs> All right, well, I'm sure you have seen one, but I'm very jealous and I really hope to see one flying around the skies of the south coast very, very shortly. But I've got to show you this. Look at this. This is a white-tailed eagle feather. It's my pride and joy. But for Scott, I mean, look at it against my head. It is absolutely huge. It's one of the most gorgeous birds in our skies and it's really exciting to have them back. Now, of course, look at that flying through. They're unmistakable with their wingspan. It's the way they saw. Now, the reintroduction project started in 2019, and it was one year later that Chris got to see them. And then they were first seen at Arne in 2021. And in the last year or so, they've become quite regular visitors to Paul Harbour and around the Isle of Purbeck. They've come from the Isle of Wight over here, which is really great to see and really, really promising as well. And, well, I can't say I've never seen one, because that's not correct. I've seen them up in Scotland, and I was really lucky to be invited when the reintroduction project started in 2019 to see them before they got released on the Isle of Wight. So here they are, they're in these kind of pens just whilst they get used to their environment. They get to use to all the scents, the smells, the sounds. And when the team were comfortable and confident that they were mature enough, they were then released out, and the hope was that there would be eight, uh, six to eight pairs in south of England once the population had established at a carrying capacity. And in 2019, 25 eagles were released. And this is the Isle of Wight reintroduction project by Forestry England and the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation. A fantastic partnership there. But I could talk to you about eagles all day, but I want to talk to you about two specific birds because we're seeing some really interesting behaviour from these two. So female, female G466 and male, G463, uh, you can see there. Now, what you might notice is that the male has only one leg. Now, his, he did have two legs. The leg disappeared in 2021. We're not exactly sure what happened, but I can say that he is still doing really well. He's very, very successful, and it's great to see these birds kind of soaring the skies in this area. But they have taken very different routes. Now, all these birds involved in the reintroduction project are tagged and means we can be really nosy and see where they're going and what they're up to. So here I've got my eagle, eagles. Let's start with the, the female first. The, the female is in blue. They started down here on the Isle of Wight. She's gone round to Cornwall. She's gone up to Dorset and she's all the way made her way through Manchester, up to Edinburgh, all the way to the most northern points of Scotland. So she's done a fair distance. But in terms of the male, look at him. So he's gone down to Cornwall and Norfolk as well. He stayed quite south. He's gone right over London and then he's made his way down here to the Channel, the most efficient point to cross the water. Over, he's gone through Belgium, the Netherlands and Denmark and Germany as well. That was in his first year. Then he came back. And then in his second year, he went all the way back up to Sweden. Overall, he's done about 10,500 miles, which is phenomenal. It shows actually he's doing really rather well. But... The pair can be seen down here in Dorset and lots of people have been getting views when they've got, come to visit the Isle of Purbeck. Now this photo was taken by Alison Copland and here you can see the female coming into land. Look at that wingspan, my goodness, an impressive bird. Now this is the male taking a rest by Dorothy Windnell. Look at that beak there, you just see how ferocious that beak is. They are amazing predators. but. They've been displaying some interesting behaviour, as I said. Now, these pair, male and female, have been pushing other white-tailed eagles off. So anyone else, anyone else that comes near gets pushed off the area. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
could they potentially start to breed? It's the first question that came into my head. Now, these two birds are only three years old. Breeding age starts at four slash five. So it could be that this time next year, we will have the very first white-tailed eagle nest and breeding in the first time in about 250 years in the south of England. Wouldn't that be fantastic? It's a similar story to our Ospreys, CJ7 and 022. This pair could be that couple for the Eagles. And I, for one, am incredibly excited about it. I'm sure you can tell. Uh, so, which is why tomorrow I'm gonna go and try and see this couple for myself. I'm gonna be heading out on a boat to the Wareham Channel just behind me to try and get a bit of a glimpse of the Eagles and both the Ospreys too. Fingers crossed I can see them. Wish me luck. Now I need to calm down a minute because I've got myself a bit overexcited because that would be brilliant to see, to see that nesting pair. So I think we all need to take a bit of a breather from the very tops of our skies to the very bottom of our forest floor. Enjoy this mindfulness moment. Pure bliss. Got to have a bit of bliss every now and again, haven't you? At the end of this show, I think you do, yes. And it is the end of the show. As you can see, the sun is setting over RSPB Arn behind us there, presenting a gorgeous scene at the end of a warm day when we've had lots of drama. We started with an amazing view. We're finishing with an amazing view of the sunset. Absolutely glorious. Well, that brings us to the end of this show that really has been full of drama. We'll be back tomorrow to see what else is going on on those nests here at Arn. But Megs, what will you be doing? I'll be out hopefully catching a glimpse of our osprey pair as well as those eagles I mentioned earlier. And I'll be heading back into the hills to meet a special creature that promises to bring the Welsh, wild Welsh woods back to their former beauty. And if you can't get enough of those cameras, remember that they are live from 10 in the morning until 10 p.m. at night, and you can find those on iPlayer or our website. I'll be with Hannah Stitfull at 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon uh, for Watch Out. That'll be live, of course, again on Facebook, Instagram, I don't... Twitter, uh, trousers, <laughs> and, and, and TikTok as well, of course. And, and do join us again at 8 o'clock tomorrow because I've just heard in my ear that something super special has slithered under our tin. See you tomorrow <laughs> night, 8 o'clock, for some reptile action. Bye-bye. What can we do to help nature and the environment? Well, sometimes big changes come from little actions. The Open University is exploring how simple and effective measures can make a big difference. To get inspired, visit bbc.co.uk slash bringwatch and follow the links to the Open University.